Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three.
Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Trinity Lutheran Church. We gather today not only to say goodbye to a dear loved one named Boyd, but to say, you know, we'll see you again in the promises of God. For today is not only a time where we grieve and where we remember the memories, and we'll certainly miss uh, Boyd, our loved one, but we also take hope in the promises of everlasting life. Uh, Salvation is his. Uh, in the mercy and grace of Almighty God. On behalf of the family, thank you all for being here. It means a great deal to them. We're glad that we can celebrate in the church today the life of Boyd and all of our lives in Jesus' name. Let's continue with our litany that's printed in your bulletin. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the source of all mercy and the God of all consolation, God comforts us in all of our sorrows so that we can comfort others in their sorrows with the consolation we ourselves have received from God. Thanks be to God. When we were baptized into Christ Jesus, we were baptized into his death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Let us pray. God of grace and glory, we remember before you today our brother Boyd. We thank you, O God, for giving him to us to know and to love as a companion in our pilgrimage on earth. In your boundless compassion, console all of us who grieve. Give us your aid so that we may see in death the gate to eternal life that we may continue our course on earth in confidence until by your call we are reunited with those who have gone before us. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The first scripture reading today, and all of these chosen by the family, 
Psalm 46. God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in time of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose stream makes glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her and she will not fall. God will help her at at the break of day. Nations are in an uproar, kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice and the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations that he can bring upon the earth. He makes wars to cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations and I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. A reading from Psalm 91. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. And I will say to the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the fouler snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers, and on his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. If you say, the Lord is my refuge, and you make the most high your dwelling, no harm will overtake you, no disaster come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Another reading from Isaiah chapter 40. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is an everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. God will not grow tired or weary in his understanding No one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope for the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Here ends the readings. And for the gospel, I invite you to stand if you're comfortable to do so. Our gospel today is from Matthew chapter 13, beginning at verse 18. Jesus tells this parable, and in this section he explains what the parable means. Listen to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in the heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble and persecution come because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke out the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop, yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. This is the gospel of the Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Boyd William Demmer, 94 years old, passed away peacefully on February 1st at Prairie Senior Cottages in New Richland, Minnesota, surrounded by family. Boyd was born on a farm near Heartland, Minnesota, on October 21, 1926, the son of William and Lillian Price Demmer, 
who raised him on the farm, milking cows and growing corn and soybeans. He was drafted by the United States Army in 1944, reporting first to Fort Snelling, followed by bases in Missouri, Texas, Oregon, and Washington, from where he traveled by boat to Japan. He remained in Japan until fall 1946, serving his last eight months as an MP. Boyd returned to the United States through San Francisco, California, before coming home to live in Albert Lee. He was discharged from the Army on December 10, 1946, and then he joined the American Legion and the National Guard, where he served until 1952. Boyd married Dorothy Johnson in August 1947. They lived in Waseca for several years, where he worked as a mechanic in a Ford car dealership. After a serious automobile accident, he began selling Ford and Oliver farm machinery. Subsequently, he relocated the family to Heartland to sell John Deere farm machinery. In 1957, Boyd, in partnership with his brother Lyle Demmer, brought the John De bought the John Deere dealership in Hayfield and moved the family there. Boyd was very active in the community, and he served Hayfield and the surrounding areas in several capacities. He served as the commander of the American Legion Rothy Post 330 in Hayfield from 63 to 64, remaining an active member for 74 years. Boyd helped charter the, American Li uh, the Hayfields Lions Club in 1966, later serving as the club president. In 1972, he was elected the district governor of Lions Multiple District 5 M1 and was honored to serve as the chairman of the governor's council. He helped recruit members for and chartered approximately 12 clubs in southeastern Minnesota. He was involved with organizing, building, and financing the Oaks Golf Country Club, serving on the board for seven years, including a term as president. Boyd actively participated uh, as a member of Trinity Lutheran Church, serving on the church council, including a term as president. And he assisted in building the Hayfield Community Swimming Pool. In 1983, Boyd sold the John Deere dealership, considering himself retired. While he continued to be actively involved with his sons in the farm operation, he and Dorothy spent time traveling to visit family and friends and to their Florida home. They also spent summer weekends with family at their Roberts, is it Robert? Ro oh, Roberts Lake Cabin in Faribault. In 1990, Boyd and Dorothy sold their Hayfield home and moved to Faribault. Boyd lived there until January 2020, when he moved to Prairie Senior Cottages. Boyd is survived by his daughter Diane and Gary Hitzman of uh, New Ringgold, Pennsylvania, and their children Allison, mother of Maya, Samuel, and Quinlan, and Alina, mother of Reese, and twins Greta and Sayer, his son Randy and Kathy Demmer of Hayfield, and their children Lori, sorry, Lauren, mother of Grant and Rowan, and mother of Olive and twins Ellis and Kai, and Margot, mother of Stella and Ivy, his daughter Lene and James Sathry of Waconia, and their children Connor, Lindsay, mother of Reagan, Ryan, father of Brooklyn, and Garrett, father of Elle, and Georgia. His grandson, Brooks Demmer of Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, son of Alan and father of Tyler, his sister, Arliss and Richard Hogg of Albert Lee, and his sister, Devana and Gerald Olson of Amory, Wisconsin. Boyd was preceded in death by his wife, Dorothy, his son, Alan, his parents, five brothers, and four sisters. May God bless the memory of an exceptional man, Boyd Demmer. Amen. Well, now it's time for some family sharing, and I understand that a few people would like to uh, say a few words, and so uh, anyone can get up first and go over to the microphone uh, there and speak nice and close into the microphone. Thank you. It almost seems surreal that we're all here today, spending the last months, days, and hours 
I was amazed how dad kept going on. And yet, in the end, I couldn't believe how fast he went. We really owe a lot of thanks to Prairie Senior Cottages for both putting up with dad and also for caring for him these past year, especially during the challenging time that we've had. His last four days, we were actually able to be with him in his room. And we are so grateful that they had the compassion to allow it. Dad would have been thrilled that all of his grandchildren are here today. Thank you for being here. So we can all be together to celebrate dad's, grandpa's, great grandpa's life. And the music, Randy, Kathy, Harry, Deb, Nancy, Judy, thank you so much. I know dad would love it and is rejoicing with mom. And thanks to all of our cousins and friends who are joining us live stream. We missed you in person. As we all know, dad could be quite difficult at times. But overall, you know what? He had a big heart full of <coughs> love and pride. Pride of his family, of us kids, and the grandchildren. Dad worked hard, but he also played really hard. I remember going to the cabin when I was younger, and we had no telephone. He said, absolutely no phone. When I go to the cabin, that's my place. That's our place for family fun times. The memories. I think of when we were younger, the 4th of July celebrations we had every year at the cabin with all of the Demmer family. Christmases we had every year with the Johnson's family and the Demmer family. Lots of people. And then later on with our families, the birthday parties, the Christmases, Thanksgiving dinner, walks, snowmobiling, skiing and tubing, and playing cards with Grandma and Grandpa. All are such wonderful memories I know we will all cherish. I love you, Dad. Thank you for all you've done for the community, for our family, and for me. As a good friend said to me, his legacy will live on in you, Lene. And I also believe in all of us. button tuck. <laughs> Not very good at that. All right, that's beautiful, Lene. Thank you. Um, for those of you who not, may not know me, uh, my name is Brooks, and uh, I am uh, Alan's son. Um, so Grandpa Boyd was one of my inspirations to serve in the armed forces. I've been in the Army for the past 12 years, and the Army is a great organization in many ways. It's the bedrock of the culture is the, uh, the Army values. It's a collection of values that random groups of people can come together and rally around. We use the acronym LEADERSHIP, which is L-D-R-S-H-I-P, because of course it wouldn't be the military without another acronym. <laughs> Loyalty, duty, respect, selfless service, honor, integrity, and personal courage. And if you're a Demer or associated with the Demers, you may also include an S on that for leaderships. Of course, that would stand for stubbornness. <laughs> We're all a little stubborn, sometimes. Grandpa Boyd often 
to live up to his name in that respect, but he also encompassed all the other values of leadership as well. He also showed immense compassion for his family. He loved his family more than anything. I remember being a young boy driving with my dad towards the cabin for the weekend, excited for all the magic and adventures I would get into with my cousins. We would pull into the driveway and Grandpa sat there waiting on our, on our arrival. It was, if it, it was if it if he had been sitting there for days with a stoic gaze out into the lake. As soon as we arrived, he would jump out of his seat with a giddy exuberance to welcome us. Over the loud music of Tom Petty, Bob Marley, and ZZ Top from my dad's stereo, Grandpa would tell us all the things he had done to prepare for the weekend. Steaks in the refrigerator, tubes filled with air, gas in the boat. He did this because he loved his family. He wanted to see his family come together and be happy. Our happiness made him happy. He was generous with the life he built. That's who Grandpa Boy was. He was a builder and a doer. He didn't achieve high academic feats, but he was educated by life. He went to bed early and he woke up early. He achieved more things in the first two hours of the day than most people achieve all day. Grandpa Boyd taught me how to ride a bike right out here in Hayfield. Probably don't know. I was nine years old and I still didn't know how to ride without my training wheels. He found that out uh, one summer when we were in the, uh, the basement of Randy and Kathy's house. And he wouldn't let me go until I got out there and committed to riding a bike. And sooner or later I rode the bike. And I went back to his house in Faribault and for the rest of, of that week, I was riding a bike all over the neighborhood. When he saw something that needed to be fixed, he fixed it. I'll remember his giggles, as if he was giggling at something he wasn't supposed to giggle at. I'll remember our pact when I asked him to not tell anyone I'd put a dead bird in my pouch when it ran into a window at the cabin. <laughs> I felt bad for the bird. I think, you know, I think I thought we could bring it back. Uh, but I'll remember how timid I was to snowmobile across the lake, but I felt comfort knowing that my grandpa was with me. I trusted my grandpa. He dealt with many things in his life that a parent should not have to deal with, like the passing of a son and wife. He found the resiliency to move forward. Remember how his life was, the strong-willed individual who loved his family. When things get difficult, I try, try to remember his words on the golf course, after I would shank a ball into the water, which happened often. <laughs> Brooks, don't swing so hard. <laughs> There's a lot of wisdom in that quote. <laughs> Finally, it seems Grandpa Boyd has brought us together one more time. I ask we'd be happy for a long life well lived because it would have brought him happiness. Thank you. so many incredible things in his life, from going to war to growing his business, serving his community to traveling the world, he lived a life full of accomplishments. To me, however, just one was important. He bought a cabin on a lake. Boyd bought a small cabin on Roberts Lake in Faribault in the early 60s without, I recently found out, even telling my grandma first. I can imagine how Dorothy felt about that. When my mom talks about that time, she always emphasizes that this wasn't a real estate investment. It was an investment in family. With his children growing up, Boyd wanted to create a place that would bring people back. A place where family gathered together in summer and winter, good times and hard times. A home away from home where his family was always welcome. He succeeded. I grew up in Minneapolis, about an hour from the lake, as we referred to the cabin. By the time I was born, the original small cabin had been upgraded to a newer building that my father designed fresh out of architecture school in the 70s, and it retained the aesthetic to prove it. It wasn't big, but it somehow held all of us, grandma and grandpa, my aunts and uncles, my cousins, and even their pets. As children, Lauren, Ann, and I would sleep three to a sofa bed, tucked in way past our bedtime, nodding off to the sounds of the grown-ups laughing and playing cards in the kitchen. We spent nearly every summer weekend there. 
In the mornings, my cousins and I ate sugary cereal that our parents wouldn't let us have at home and donuts from the resort down the street. We woke to find quarters in the special pouches that my grandma and grandpa gave us to hold our resort money, coins destined for pinball machines and ring pops. During the day, we swam and water skied and went for boat rides with Grandpa Boyd at the wheel, driving his John Deere speedboat in endless circles around the lake. At night, we swatted mosquitoes and caught toads and all ate together, 10 or 15 of us, squished around the kitchen table, watching the sunset over the lake. It was magic. As I got older, I brought my friends to the cabin. Grandpa Boyd would make burgers and then graciously hand the keys to his boat over to a teenage boy, trusting him because he trusted me. Eventually, I brought my own family back to the cabin. I remember walking to the resort with my Uncle Randy one summer a few years ago, my son toddling at my side. Randy shared how special it was that he had made that short walk when he was a kid, then with his kids, and now with his grandkids. Three generations, same amazing donuts. My grandpa Boyd invested in family and at work. To me, that will always be the greatest gift that he and my grandma left us. He bought a cabin on a lake. It wasn't the fanciest cabin or the fanciest lake, but it brought us all together weekend after weekend, year after year. Because of his investment, I grew up alongside my grandma and grandpa, aunts, uncles, and cousins. They became my family more than me. They became the people I can always rely on in summer and winter, good times and hard times. My family and I live in Colorado now. We make it back to Minnesota once or twice a year. Whenever we do, we stay at Grandpa Boyd's cabin. Like Randy, I am lucky enough to share my favorite place in this world with my children, to buy them donuts and jump off the dock and tuck them in, three kids to a bed. These days, my husband and I dream of buying our own cabin. Because of my grandpa Boyd, I understand the power of a place that is purpose-built to bring people together. Because of him, I know that the investment is worth far more than money, that I'm investing in my family's memories, their bonds, and their future. To me, that is my grandpa Boyd's legacy. He bought a cabin on a lake, he created a family destination, and I will always be grateful. <clears throat> Thanks, Alina. The sugar cereal tradition continues to this day. When I first thought about what to say today, I, of course, thought about my memories of Grandpa, the cabin. And actually, Margot reminded me this morning of the song he used to sing us when we would swing, the da, 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 don't, and we all laughed at the don't part. Many trips to Florida. We took a family trip to South Dakota. We took cruises. We celebrated New Year's together. And there are many, there were many dents on the cabin ceiling from popping the champagne cork. We would do that on purpose, shake it up, pop it to the ceiling. But then I started to think back on the life he led before I existed. He is the definition of a self-made man. With an eighth grade education, he went to school to be a mechanic. Then he did well enough in his jobs that he was able to buy a business. He did well enough at that to be able to buy several parcels of real estate in Hayfield and elsewhere. I remember someone telling me once that they would buy new cars every year. I see the drive in him, that insatiable drive to do more, to do better, to always keep moving, to always keep building. Doing these things requires a lot of courage. It requires a person to set their, their fears of the risks and the unknowns aside to take that leap into entrepreneurship and be successful. Thinking about what to say today made me realize where I get my entrepreneurial drive from. He passed that on to my dad, who passed that on to me. I know the work that I had to do on myself and in my own mind to be able to build the business that I have built. I recognize the advantages that I had, or that I have had, that he did not. Completion of high school, college, law school, and all of the information that's now available to us due to the internet. He didn't have any of that when he built his businesses. Yet he built and ran a very successful business that no doubt helped lay the groundwork for the life we all lead today. 
thank you grandpa for all of that all of the memories everything that you've done for all of us i love you I think I may have made a mistake by going last. Pretty tough to tell. <laughs> Wasn't going to happen. I just want to start out, like Renee, thanking everybody for being here. It means so much. I know Dad would have loved to be able to be here greeting every single one of you, and you know how he liked to visit, and he always had something to say, and. Hopefully it stayed civil, because as you know, he, uh, he didn't have many filters. Um, but rest assured, he's looking down on us and feeling very appreciative that we're all here celebrating his life today. You know, we all knew my dad in different ways. You heard from my, my daughters and my nieces and my nephew. Uh, they saw him in their, through their light. And They knew. They knew what a joy <laughs> they were for him. But you know, many of us here knew him in many different ways. He was a husband, he was a dad, father-in-law, grandpa, great-grandpa, and of course a mechanic and a farmer, a John Deere dealer. He was a Legion Club member, he was a Lions Club member, he was a golfer. He was active in his church, and he was a shaker and a mover. Uh, he liked to do things in the community, and it reached out even in the surrounding area. He could be abrasive. Um, we've all experienced that, and uh, he, was, he was a character. But those who really knew him knew as somebody you could really count on to be actively involved if there was something new, something innovative, and something needed to be done. Some of the projects come to mind, you've heard, the Legion Club expanding downstairs into the former appliance store, establishment of the Lions Club, construction of the swimming pool, Centennial in Hayfield, he was so excited about that, I remember that. Um, organization, establishment of the Oaks, and of course the installation of these beautiful stained glass windows here in the church, he was part of that. He gave generously, he invested countless hours, and he provided tools and equipment whenever and wherever they were needed by anybody. He really didn't seek much for accolation or for accolades or public recognition. But I know that it meant a lot when people would notice and acknowledge his efforts and his contributions. He would tell me, and I'm paraphrasing this, but he would talk to me a lot. It doesn't really matter, Randy, what people know or think about you. Just do the right thing. Be proud of what you've gotten accomplished and just keep moving forward. Family was his absolute priority, and you heard that. Couldn't have said it any, I could not have said it as well as they can say it, and I'm not going to try. And we all have individual stories. I'm just going to give you one. Now, mine would predate all of these people. When my dad was chasing around the country, selling machinery and doing whatever he was doing, I was this little guy, and he would take me with him. And I would ride with him in the car. Now, this is before seat belts and all this kind of stuff. I would stand next to him, right next to him in the seat, my arm around his neck, hanging on. And we would drive around the countryside. And I can still remember to this day doing that, and it was just, I enjoyed it. Sometimes I'd sit in that car for an hour or two while he went and visited with a farmer. But it didn't matter, I'd wait, because I got a chance to be with my dad. One of the things he would do in driving around, he would listen to these, as you know, he was eighth grade education, but he always wanted to improve himself. He would listen to tapes. I'm talking about the self-improvement, motivational type of things, Zig Ziglar, um, Dale Carnegie, that kind of stuff. He believed strongly in those kinds of things. And he had, a, he had a, a cassette case full of these things. And he'd listen to them, and we'd listen to them. He'd listen to them with me. And he said, now, now you listen to what they're saying, Randy. He explained to me what he was going to do, and we'd listen to these tapes. And he'd say, now, pay attention, because what these guys are saying and lessons that you can listen to, keep in mind, I'm a little kid standing next to him on a seat, right? But he said, 
These will help you to be confident. They'll tell, they'll tell you how you what you need to do to succeed and how you can make yourself better. He said they'll help you in your school. They'll help you in sports. Someday they'll help you in business, whatever you do, and they'll be helpful in your, in your life. And I always remember that. I remember those tapes. I was blessed to work with my dad my entire life. It wasn't always easy. Jeez, we argued a lot, as you might imagine. And sometimes loudly. But I learned so much being with him, how to treat people, sometimes how not to treat people. <laughs> um, to be ethical and honest in my dealings with everybody. Not to judge people before you get to know them. He was so strong on that. To be concerned, to not to be concerned where people came from, what their religion was. Don't worry about how they talk or what the color of their skin was. Embrace and enjoy the sense of accomplishment or satisfaction, the goals of volunteering and community service, the importance of providing support and encouragement, and showing pride in the efforts and accomplishment of others, especially your loved ones. Dad would often say, the sky's the limit. He could think outside the box. He was a manipulator. We all know that, don't we? And he was an innovator. Above all, he really loved and cared for his family. It was number one. We all got to experience his anger and what we perceived at times with unreasonableness. But at the core, just like anybody else who knew him, we knew he loved us and we knew we could count on it whenever we needed something or he perceived that we needed something. Dad's spirit will always be with me and I think with those of us who knew him well. Thank you again for being here today.
Do we have any kids in here that like to play in a sandbox? You like to play in sandboxes? Well, let me tell you a story of a little boy who was playing in his sandbox on a Saturday morning. He had with him his box of cars and trucks and his plastic pail and a shiny red plastic shovel. Well, in the process of creating roads and tunnels in that soft sand, he discovered a big rock right in the middle of the sandbox. So he dug around the rock and was able to dislodge it, you know, to loosen it up. And with no little bit of, bit of struggle, he used his legs to push and nudge that rock to the edge of that little wall around the sandbox, but he couldn't get it over the wall. After all, he was a small boy, and the rock was really big. Well, when the boy got the rock to the edge he realized he couldn't roll it up, and so he shoved and he pushed and he pried with his arms this time, making no progress. You know, the rock would just go up there to the edge of the wall and fall back right into the sandbox. And so the little boy struggled and he grunted and he pushed and he shoved, but his only reward was to have that rock roll back into the sandbox and squishing his chubby little fingers. Finally, he just burst into a tears of frustration. Now, all the time, guess who was watching from the living room window? His dad. And at the moment the tears fell, the large shadow fell across the boy in the sandbox. It was the boy's father. Gently but firmly, he asked, Son, why didn't you use all the strength that you had available? Well, the defeated-looking boy sobbed back, but Daddy, Daddy, I did. I used all my strength. No, no, son, said the dad. You didn't. You didn't use all the strength that you had. You know why? Because you didn't ask me. With that, the father reached down. He picked up the rock out of the sandbox and put it on the other side of the wall. Grace and peace to all of you through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ to Boyd's family and grandkids, great-grandkids, friends, loved ones. During so much of our lives, I think, we employ all of our strength in such a way that we only tap out of our own energy, out of our own limited strength. And then it's easy to get frustrated and confused. But today, and actually every day, I want us all to remember that we have a Father who cares that doesn't intend to sit and look out the window while we struggle with frustration to deal with the large rocks that are in our lives, figuratively. But he wants us to ask him, and he will move those big rocks. As a teenager, oh, I did, a, I did many days of rock picking, and those rocks were so stubborn. I hated carrying those rocks. Well, figuratively, in my life, I haven't enjoyed carrying the the rocks that I've chosen to carry either. And every day I have to ask the Lord, Lord, whether it's fear, whether it's uh, resentment, whether it's frustration, difficulties, Lord, take these rocks 
I used to pull weeds too. I pulled a lot of weeds. And I enjoyed clearing things from the soil because it was fun to see that when seeds are planted in soil, without rocks and weeds in the way, they'll grow up and be a good crop. The seeds would grow to their fullest potential. Not only that, you could see it. You could see it. Matthew 13, verse 23, Jesus tells this story about being good soil. Soil where there doesn't have to be rocks and thorns and weeds in the way. And he says, but the seed falling on good soil came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than what was sown. Well, we know that good soil makes a big difference in creating a big crop. Jesus tells this story uh, uh, knowing the farming practices of his day so many years ago when a farmer would take seed and scatter the seed with his hand in the fields and some of it would no doubt land in the pathway or go even further than that. Not surprisingly, then, a portion of the seed fell into places that were too poor for any kind of production of a crop. And the story in this parable that Jesus taught in the Bible, I read the last portion of it earlier, you know, Jesus is saying so much more than what real farming is all about. He's talking in such a figurative way that we might look at where our hearts are at with regards to soil. Are we good soil? Do we feel like we're good soil within? Fears and worries and resentments, busyness can choke away the good soil in our lives that God wants us to have. But further in, in Matthew chapter 19, he gives us the good words, all things are possible in Christ. Meaning, even though those weeds and thorns and rocks seem to push up out of the ground and they end up figuratively so much in our lives, we know that as Christ gives a hand, we know that we can do so much in him and be that good soil. Daily asking for God's help, Rocks are lifted from our hearts and weeds and thorns and thistles are pulled up from our lives because of the good soil of forgiveness. And this kind of soil, good soil, produces much. Produces much, not for just ourselves though. Because the good soil that Jesus talks about isn't our talents or it isn't our abilities that one uses for him or herself. But it's having a servant heart. Good soil that God helps to cultivate and stir up, not for ourselves, but for the sake of others around us. So it doesn't surprise me at all when a few of us family members sat around the table planning this celebration of life for Boyd, and this theme of good soil came up. This theme of, of Boyd being uh, a man who was, uh, was good soil, not only in his ideas and creativity, and his uh, desire to produce, but also in the foundation that he had in so many different things. And as I heard family members uh, talk about Boyd, their relationship with him, it just puts an exclamation point on how God used Boyd, a man with good soil. Grandpa Boyd was one of those guys who loved, who, who, who loved the Lord so much, and uh, he loved the Lord for the sake of other people whether as a dad or husband or grandpa, great-grandpa or friend, whether as a serviceman in the military, whether as a servant in so many uh, civic areas of life, whether as a volunteer in church activities, Boyd was a child of God who loved family, country, church, community very deeply. And of course, the time that I was able to spend with Dorothy and Boyd were, were blessings for me over these past several years. And uh, I could certainly see how they loved the Lord. I can certainly see how they loved their family. I know these past few years hasn't been easy for Boyd at all. It's so hard to lose the love of your life in Dorothy. It's very difficult to lose your ability to control your own life. It's so very difficult to be moved from one's home into temporary residences that you don't care for too much. But now Boyd is with the Lord, loving and dancing with Dorothy, having his arm around Alan and embracing 
his loved ones, enjoying the eternal peace of his eternal home. And all of this, of course, is pure gift of God. Pure gift, that's what salvation is in Jesus Christ. Pure gift that we can, rather than grieve death today, we can celebrate life. So I want to end with this story. I want you to envision a story. Kids, are you ready? I'm going to tell you a story about a big mean bee. Are you ready for a bee story? Okay. It's kind of scary in the beginning, but it doesn't, it doesn't have a scary ending. It's a good ending. Here it goes. I want you to envision a family that's on vacation. And they're driving along the highway with the windows rolled down and the warm breeze is coming in on this wonderful sunny day. But all of a sudden, a big, mean-looking black bee flies into the window and starts buzzing around inside of the car. With a little girl in the back seat, she's really, really allergic to bees. Bee stings, and if she's bitten, she could get really sick and maybe even die. Oh, Daddy, she squealed in terror. It's a bee. It's a bee. It's going to sting me. So the father quickly pulls off the car to a stop, reaches back to try to catch the bee, and the, and the bee buzzes towards him, and it bumps against the, the windshield, and the dad takes his hand and traps the bee and puts the bee within his fist. He doesn't squish it, though. He just waits for that inevitable sting. And with the pain of the sting, he opens his hand and the bee starts buzzing around again and his little daughter says, Daddy, the bee's loose. He's going to sting me. And the dad looks at his daughter gently and says, He won't sting you anymore. And he held out his hand and he said, Look, honey. And she saw there in his hand the stinger of the bee. You know, Paul in the Bible exalted in 1 Corinthians 15, he said, O oh, death, where is thy victory? O oh, death, where is thy sting? He could have just as well said, Death, you're just a big, ugly bee. That's what you are. A bee that doesn't have a stinger. Well, Jesus, when he opens up his hands and we see the nail-scarred hands and we realize what Jesus did for us on the cross, he took away the sting of death. He took away the sting of sin. He took away the sting of worthless feelings that we have. Jesus took all the, the stingers away. And because of that, evil just, you know, the big black bumblebee just flies away worthless. Well, we have victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so we say, oh God, thank you for Boyd's life, all he meant to us. We place him into your arms of grace, for he is free in you. May we then live as on eagle's wings, help, hoping and trusting in the Lord for guidance, and living with servant hearts, servant hearts, asking God to remove the rocks, or maybe helping each other too, every single day. Amen. We have another song.
In response to the good news that we have heard today in Christ Jesus, let us confess our faith in the Holy Trinity. The words of the Apostles' Creed are printed in your bulletin, and if you're comfortable, I invite you to stand as we confess together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. And now let us pray. Almighty God, you have knit your chosen people together in one communion. In the mystical body of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And so give to all of us, in heaven and on earth, your light and your peace. Lord, in your mercy. Grant that all who have been baptized into Jesus' death and resurrection, that we may die to sin and rise to newness of life every day, and that through the grave and gate of death, we may pass with him to our joyful resurrection. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, grant to us who are still on our journey on this pilgrimage and who walk as yet by faith that your Holy Spirit may lead us in holiness, righteousness, and forgiveness all of our days. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, grant to all who mourn a sure confidence in your loving care that casting all their sorrow on you, they may know the consolation of your love. And so, Lord, especially bless this family as they grieve. Give them courage that they may have strength to meet the days ahead and the comfort of a holy and certain hope and the joyful expectation of being all together as one in heaven with you. Lord, in your mercy. Grant us grace, Lord, to entrust to your never-failing love which sustained him in this life. Receive him into the arms of your mercy and remember him according to the favor you bear for your people. Lord, in your mercy. And Father, God of all grace, you sent your Son, our Savior Jesus, to bring life and immortality to light. We give you thanks because by his death, Jesus destroyed the power of death and by his resurrection has opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers. Make us certain that because he lives, we shall live also, and that neither death nor life nor things present nor things to come shall be able to separate us from your love, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, who lives and reigns with you, the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now let us be seated as we hear and pray the Lord's Prayer.
into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. I invite you to stand again. Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant Boyd. Acknowledge, O God, we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming, a lamb of your own kind. Receive him into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the company of the glorious light of all the saints. Amen. Let us go forth in peace. Mm -hmm.